Let us remain standing just a moment now for prayer as we bow our heads. Eternal and blessed God, we are thankful for this privilege of being here in this place tonight, this hippodrome, an arena. And we are so happy to see that people in a daring snowstorm still has the courage to come out to hear the Word of God, and that the faith of our fathers is living still in spite of dungeon, sword, or death. And I'm thankful, Lord, to be associated tonight along this group of the purchase of thy blood. We would ask that you would visit us tonight in a very special way. Bless this little group. And we pray that when the service is ended, as we go to our different homes, may we be able to say like those who came from Emmaus, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us along the road? For we ask that in Jesus' name, thy Son, amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> As I was coming down t tonight, we were late because you can just drive real slow. The snowstorms are so terrific. And I was thinking that people who come to a service on a night like this certainly did not come out to be seen. They come out because they love the Lord Jesus. And Jesus said in his word, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. And there's something about the gospel that's been the world's greatest drawing card. No matter if it's even preached in its simplicity, yet it has something about it that nothing else has ever touched the heart of man to draw them like the gospel of the Lord Jesus. And I am grateful to God for you group. That's out tonight. Many people living at a distance would say, now, wait a minute. They're going to be there ten nights. I want to go, but not on a night like this. Well, that's, that's all right. But you have, have dared the storm. Now, we pray that God will bless you and will meet everything that you have need of. I'm here to be your brother and servant of Christ. And now... I don't want to keep you very long. Tomorrow is Sunday, and if any of you visitors are here from other parts of the country, I'm sure that you'll be welcome to some of these fine churches around here in the morning. I know that there is many. I have looked over the little uh, ads of churches, and there's many fine churches here that represents the church that you've come from. And if you have no church, then find one somewhere in the morning and go. There's some ministers, I guess, that set you on the platform, and they'd be glad to have you at their churches. I'm sure they would. Give you a visitor's card if they do so in their church, so that you can take to your own church and your, if you won't be counted missing in your Sunday school. Then tomorrow afternoon, the Lord willing, it falls my lot to speak tomorrow afternoon. That is, not only healing service, but an evangelistic message. And if you and your pastor and your congregation can see to come, we'd be happy to have you. <clears throat> Sunday, we do not ask people to leave their post of duty unless the church has fully cooperated and you have no services at your church. We're here as a visitor. We don't want to pull anyone from their post of duty. We're trying to help that church to grow. And we want every member at his own church. And then if you have sickness and you want to be prayed for tomorrow night, get permission from your pastor. Tell him what you want to do. If it's the only night that you can get here, we'd be glad to have you. But first is your duty at your church. And tomorrow afternoon, everybody, I guess, has no services tomorrow afternoon. So if you can, come out. I want to preach on tomorrow afternoon, if the Lord willing, a perverted life. And 
be about an hour of your time, I suppose, and they've announced what time the services would start, I suppose, at 2.30. Every creed, denomination, color, race, everybody's welcome. Now, thinking tonight in this little group so I wouldn't keep you too long, being late to start with, and we appreciate the custodians who uh, let us have uh, the lights and stays and waits with us. I met two of the gentlemen the first day in here and I said, what time should we close? He said, that's up to you. Now that's really nice. I appreciate that. We all appreciate that from that man. And um, I told him that usually we were out by 9.30 each night when we have a long campaign like this. And now I want to speak to you a little from the Word. How many loves the Word? Oh, there's something about it that's real. I think the Word should be read in every service because my Word will fail, your Word will fail, but God's Word can never fail because it's the Word of God. And I think tonight, just for a little text that I've used before in other places, I would like to call your attention to Matthew, the 12th chapter, 42nd verse. And I got a little thought from this when I seen where Brother Paul Boyd had wrote a little article in a paper. He's a Mennonite brother. And I would preached on this at another place, and perhaps that's where Brother Boyd had picked it up. And I want to read for a moment, and I'll probably approach it from a different standpoint. And now, from tomorrow on, every afternoon there will be services, instruction services, as our lovely brother, Dr. Vail, will be explaining to us the word of faith from the Bible each afternoon beginning tomorrow through the rest of the service. I don't know whether Brother Vail has announced it yet of the going home of Brother Bosworth. How many ever know Brother F.F. F. Bosworth? He's happier tonight than he's ever been. He's in glory. The gallant soldier, one of the most outstanding Bible teachers on divine healing I ever met in my life. I've read of many great men, and I've read their history. I've heard them that had a little mark here and a little black mark here and a little mark against them over here, but never one voice did I ever hear or anything against F. F. Bosworth. He was a man that lived what the Bible teaches. He was the most honest and upright and unguiled person that I know of. He, a few years ago, about three years ago, taken a tour way down in South Africa with me, around 80 years old, been on the battlefield since a little boy. He was preaching the gospel before I was born. And down in them battlefields among the natives, a preaching the gospel. When I met him a few weeks ago, when I went to see him just before his leaving here, when I walked into the building, this come on my heart. My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. As those old trembling hands reached for me, he said, Brother Branham, this is the happiest time of my life. He said, I'm expecting any minute for him to walk in the door and I'll go home with him. Before he left, he saw a vision of heaven. And about two hours before his passing over, he went into a coma, raising up in his bed, shaking hands with someone and greeting people that he had met and preached the gospel to had been gone for years. I think this of him. Lives of great men all remind us. And we can make our lives sublime with partings leave behind us footprints on the sands of time. I'm sure that he got to shake hands with Paul Rader, which was an associate to him. How many ever heard of Paul Rader? He wrote my theme song 
only believed. How little did he know that boy sitting at his feet would take this song around the world. It's called me in, I don't know how many languages, hundreds of languages around the world as a theme song. Paul, when he died in California, they had pulled the curtains down and had, uh, had the little Bible or the little quartet Moody Bible Institute down there singing songs. They were singing, Near My God to Thee. And if all that know Paul know he had a sense of humor. And he looked up and he said, Who's dying? Your eye. He said, Pull back those shades and sing me some real snappy gospel songs. And they begin to sing, Down at the cross where my Savior died. He said, That sounds better. And then he said, Where's Luke? Luke was his brother. Luke and Paul stuck together and worked together like my son and I. They were brothers and buddies. He said, where's Luke? Luke was in the next room. He couldn't stand to see his brother die. So he said, tell Luke to come here. And Luke came in. He took Luke by the hand. He said, Luke, we've been a long ways together and through a many hard battles. But think of it, Luke, in five minutes from now, I'll be standing in the presence of Jesus Christ, clothed in his righteousness. Let me go like that. Let my end be like that. I've held them when they screamed and fought devils off of them and so forth. I've seen men go in all kinds of conditions. Let me go as a Christian. Let me come to the last beat of my heart, knowing this when I go into that big dark chamber, yonder, that's called death. I don't want to go in like a coward. I want, when I know it's my end, I want to wrap myself in the robes of His righteousness, entering into death, knowing this, that I know Him in the power of His resurrection, that when He calls, I'll come out from among the dead some of these days. May God rest the soul of F.F. F. Bosworth in peace. I'm supposed to preach His funeral Monday. If I preach His funeral, I have to miss both Sunday and Monday services here. Brother Vale is trying to get a hold of Sister Bosworth to ask if Brother Roberts or somebody could do it because there'll be many ministers there that could do it and he's to be buried Monday at 2 o'clock. In respects of this great war here, before we read the Word of God, let's stand to our feet and offer prayer to God for this gallant life. Yeah. Oh, blessed God, as Christians... We bow our heads to the dust from where we was taken, and some day we shall return if Jesus tarries. There is one who has walked among us and preached to us, thy humble and holy servant, Brother F. F. Bosworth. Tonight his body lays in a casket. But his soul is with thee, O oh God. And across the border, as he was coming down to the river the other morning, and the waves was flying high in the air at the old Jordan, we know that there was many friends to meet him by preaching the gospel. That by that cause, he had brought them to a saving knowledge of thy dear son, and they were there to meet him. We trust that you will bless his gallant soul, and let us remember by his life and his examples and his teachings and how firm he stood on thy eternal word until he lived to be a ripe old age way many years over the allotted time. We pray for Sister Bosworth for his daughters and his sons we feel that our loss will be heaven's gain and let us now press hard in the battle for a great officer of this army has been taken thy wise province thou has granted this and we pray that it will make us now seeing that we're one less that we may buckle on the full armor of God and fight until Jesus comes for we ask it in his name. Amen. You may be seated.
The God of heaven rests the soul of Daddy Bosworth in peace. I too shall come to that end someday, and you too. Let me go like that in peace. While I'm here, let me do all that I can for the kingdom of God. In the twelfth chapter of St. Matthew's Gospel, and the forty-second verse, I read for a scripture lesson. And the queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation, and shall condemn it, for she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Jesus had just been in the discussion. He was having a great campaign. And as such a campaign as Jesus would have, it brought out mixed multitudes. When the supernatural is done, has been done, rather, it causes mixed multitudes. It brings this class of people, believers, unbelievers, and make-believers. And it always has did that. And in this great discussion, he had been presenting the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit and many of the people had believed on him. But as usual, there are those who would not believe. And the sad part of it is, my brethren, is to think of it in this light, that those people that cannot believe were ordained to that condemnation. That's the scripture. If you are a believer tonight, you should bow your head in reverence and humbleness to thank God that He chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world. Because no man can come to me, said Jesus, except my Father draws him. And God, by foreknowledge, not willing that any should perish, but by foreknowledge knew who would so He could predestinate from the beginning. All things. Jesus come to save those who the Father saw before the foundation of the world that would be saved. And therefore, these religious people, Pharisees, very religious teachers, oh, if God willing, we want to get down in that this week, in the Word, and notice they were very highly educated scholarly, holy, and yet unbelievers, religious men, teachers, priests, their fathers and their father's father's father were priests before them. They had to be Levites to be a priest. They had to be renowned. They had to be without blemish and without fault. Holy man, but yet were considered and were unbelievers. And Jesus said, You are of your father, the devil. The highest religious man in the world at that present time, Jesus said, Their father was the devil. These men, all disturbed about the supernatural, they said it must be some sort of a setup. But when they seen that a mechanical setup wouldn't produce the evidence, therefore they never spoke it out loud. They said it in their hearts. He has the spirit of Beelzebub. Could you imagine a man so blind to the Scriptures that would see the power of the Almighty God 
performing signs that only God could do that were foretold in the Bible that would be done by the Messiah, and then called that spirit an unclean spirit. They didn't speak it loud. They didn't have to speak it loud. Jesus knows the thoughts of your heart. Notice it in the meetings. What's in the meetings when evil arises? What's the spirit? Pick it up like last night. Before it ever got started. It's the Holy Spirit. And as this taken place, they reasoned in their hearts, 25th verse, and said, This man is Beelzebub, which is the great spirit of the devil, fortune teller or something. And Jesus said, If they call the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Because they've got eyes but can't see. They're scholars, learned, polished. But that isn't it. God doesn't come by knowledge. If that would have been so in the Garden of Eden when they eat from the tree of knowledge, they'd know more about God than they ever did. By knowledge brings death. We only know God by faith. Has nothing to do with your education or any of your social status. It's only by faith are you saved and that to the grace of God. Only by faith and by the grace of God can you believe God. Now notice, he said that he perceiving their thoughts in their heart. They said, this man is a, a faker. He is a Beelzebub. What a spirit to be on a person. That's as soon as it struck him, Jesus knew it. And he said, you can call the Son of Man that kind of a name and I'll forgive you. But when the Holy Ghost has come and you speak that against Him, it will never be forgiven you in this world or in the world to come. Weigh that in the balance for a few moments and think what that means. It shall never be forgiven to man to blaspheme against the Holy Ghost because they said this is an unclean spirit. Now, many of you have wondered what is the unpardonable sin. There it is. My mother used to be because that she didn't know any better. She said it's a woman that would before childbirth would have an abortion case, taking the life of an innocent baby who didn't have a chance to bring, be brought forth in the world. My father differed with her. He said it's a man that would take his own life. If a man takes his own life, he's insane. So look, the scripture is the background. Jesus said, if you speak a word against the Holy Spirit, it shall never be forgiven you. All sin shall be forgiven except that sin. And that's unbelief. Oh, what a horrible thing that unbelief is. And the most unbelievers are religious people. The most unbelievers, I quote, again, is religious people. It's been in every age. And this age is no exception. It's religious people who are unbelievers. And most time when people are religious, they think God owes them something. I 
have seen people who's been lived in church a straight life come to the platform and fail to be healed when a prostitute off the street would come humbly and bow in the presence of God and reckon herself to be a prostitute and ask forgiveness and be healed of sarcoma's cancer. Where a Christian walked this across with merely a little headache and failed to get it. God doesn't judge you or heal you by your church affiliation. It's according to your faith you are healed. <clears throat> then he went on and began to upbraid them and scorn them for their unbelief. And he brought up this year notable statement. The queen of the south shall rise in the judgment. Now, God in all ages has always declared himself through the supernatural. You ask any Bible reader, any theologian that's honest, and they will tell you that when the supernatural is displayed, it's in the presence of God. God always brings supernatural because He is supernatural. And in every age when He displays Himself, it's in the supernatural. He does it because he loves people, and he loves to separate his believers from the unbelievers. Notice, in the age that Jesus was speaking of, was in the age of Solomon. Now when God sends something to the earth, oh, I would that every church member listen close to that when God sends something to the church in every age, if the people receive it, it becomes a great thing. And the church is, em is empowered and great things take place. But if the church rejects it, that church goes out into darkness. Now, you historians, skip back through the ages just a little bit and see if that's right or wrong. You Bible readers, go back to the Old Testament and bring it down to each age. God changes not. And he was referring to Solomon. Solomon, God gave Solomon... Just a man who had his ups and downs and his differences, just like you and I do. But God gave this man a gift because he was going to make him present him to the church. Now, if the church had turned him down, Israel would have never have had that golden age. And anyone knows that Israel prospered more under the reign of Solomon than any other king they ever had. The temple was built. The world bowed at the feet of Solomon. And he wasn't a war man. He was a man who was empowered with the gift of the Holy Spirit and all of his kingdom recognized it. He had a gift of discernment to discern things. And when this great gift was manifested, all the people with one accord to give thanks unto God and was looking for it to come. Would it not be a great thing tonight if all of the church of the living God 
would recognize the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, the all-sufficient gift to the church, and the working of the Holy Spirit. I was reading an article today in the Cornet about old-time religion coming back and how it begins to bring and talk about the Pentecostal church. Now, we Baptists and all the rest of us has to recognize that the Pentecostal church is the fastest growing Protestant church in all the world. In all their differences, and all of their misunderstandings, yet they come from a little tin can alley until they possess the best churches in the land. Right? And all their faults. If all of the oneness and the Trinitarians and all of the little isms would get out of that great church, she'd rise as a mighty conqueror. But they're so split and divided. Satan's got them shooting at one another. And instead of all their guns turned on him. And they shoot at the Methodists, they shoot at the Baptists, they shoot at one another. And the selfishness, the motives are not right. The objectives is not right. But in the spite of all that, the blessed Holy Spirit dwells among them. Right. And then the strange thing to be that they can't recognize the Holy Spirit's work and all come together and unite their efforts for the kingdom of God. The Baptist is just as hungry for the Holy Spirit as you Pentecostals are. But you're so broke up. And have brought so much disgrace because the Baptists and Methodists and so forth are scared to take a hold of it. And it's by your actions that's brought this thing. Every mortal being has some hunger in him for God. Now, everybody was with Solomon, one accord. And look how the news of that swept out. All across the lands, around the world, every heathen nation knew that Israel had a gift in their midst. He wasn't a prophet. He just had a gift. And they recognized it. And the church recognized it. The nation recognized it. And all the other nations by that knew that it was real. Wouldn't that be nice tonight if the great church of Jesus Christ were there millions times, millions of heathens going to hell every year because we don't recognize the gift among us. Notice this just a little bit. And as the news swept up way down in the land of Sheba. If you mark it on the map, it was a long ways across the Sahara to the utmost parts of the known world in that day. There was a little heathen queen. And everybody come by must have told her, you should go up into Israel. Oh, they got a man up there who is, has a gift of God, and they say it is most outstanding. The travelers come by. Oh, what did say? I've seen the difference, and this great man through his spirit of discernment of their God settled the thing. Faith cometh by what? Hearing. Hearing the Word. The Word of the living God. And how they must have longed to get up there to see it. Finally, the little queen decided that she would go and find out for herself all she had heard 
Now, if you've got any speck of spirit about you, you're interested in knowing about God. Of course, those that are dead in sin and trespasses, they might be preachers. But that doesn't mean anything. Those Pharisees were priests too, teachers. Dead! My mother, an old southern woman, used to have an expression, you can't get blood out of a turnip. It has no blood. So how can you teach supernatural things to people who have no conception of supernatural? That's our nation as a people. Oh, we're so suspicious. I'll notice what's taking place. And as the little queen heard, it roused her curiosity. And she said, I'll go and see for myself. I'd like to visit that campaign. I would like to go back and sit down for a while and just watch and listen with an open heart. I wish everyone in Waterloo felt that way. She said, I'll go, I'll not go critical. I'll just go and see if the things that they tell me is true. Now, look what that little woman had to confront. The first place, she was a woman. And she had a long journey. And the desert was full of robbers. Not only that, but she took something with her. She said, if it is true, then I'm going to support it. She was she laden, so she laden her camels with gold and frankincense and spices. Perhaps the best she had in her kingdom. But to us, we take God at second place third place, even last place. But she was putting God first place. And now a heathen, pagan, and she laid in the camels. Now look, she had at least three months journey before her. Three months. Not in an air-conditioned train, neither in a great Cadillac, but she had to ride on the back of a camel. Some people won't come across the street. Some has nothing to do with it at all. You couldn't go pick them up in a Cadillac and drive them a city block. Oh, they want nothing to do with it. No, sir. My church has nothing to do with that kind of stuff. Get it away. Not even got the, the intelligence. I'm not enough spirit to even come and see for themselves. And if they would sit down a minute, they'd criticize everything was done. But God will move just the same. Because he's got to do that in order to rise and condemn that person in the, er, in the resurrection. Search the scriptures and see if that ain't God's plan always. Or if it come with flowers. If it come in high pomp, great glory, where not no disregards, but some great well-known evangelist or some great famous doctor of divinity, oh, they'd like to be represented where the mayor of the city would come out. The same thing was thought when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. They never sang hosannas. When the king was born, but the angels sung it, not to kings and potentates, but to shepherds on the hillsides. He wasn't born in a fine, decorated hospital room with pink dressings hanging down. He was born in a stinking manger. How could they ever go to hear a man like that, no matter what he done? You see, what? Pride and selfishness does, it shuts you up from the kingdom of God. 
I wonder sometimes, as we think, what will happen to this generation? Then as the queen, she laid in her camels, she took all these things, and on the desert, what would she confront? A little woman with a little bunch of men marching along with her while the sons of Ishmael was out there, the robbers of the desert, and she was laden with gold. She had to think about that. But if in her heart she was hungering to find out whether that gift was real or not, God made a way for her. And God will make a way for every man or woman who's hungering and thirsting for righteousness' sake. God makes a way. Don't be as scared that something's going to happen. It won't happen. Go anyhow. Be determined to press in to see the kingdom of God. And she went on till she come to the gates of the palace. And now notice, she never come just to hear one night's meeting. She unladen the camels and set up her tits and was going to stay till she was convinced. We'll set about five minutes and draw our conception. Gone. The devil will sit on your shoulder and say, Ah, that's not right. You say, that's right, Mr. Devil. You're my, I, I love you. Sure. Let's get out of here. Then what are you going to do when you stand with that queen in the judgment? Notice. Then when she unloaded her camels and she took her mistresses and the little servant girls and she gathered in the courtrooms where the revival is being held. And she watched with an open heart. Not just this little woman down in the alley. Not the little washwoman on the corner. But a queen. Then we think we're somebody. Too good to go to a meeting. Oh, our social standing. I want mine to be in heaven. So, when she unloaded and set down. That's a good way to do. Unload and set down. Unload your, sus your suspicions, all your superstitions, all your unbelief and set down and watch the kingdom for the kingdom of God. And as she sat and Solomon came out, then she watched until the time that the Holy Spirit began to move on Solomon. And she saw that great discernment. I can just see her punch the little maid sitting by her, saying, look at that. Did ever you see such in our church? It must come from their God. And after a while, another case come up, and Solomon with the spirit of discernment, it discerned it perfectly. And when she was convinced, she went to Solomon and she said, All that I have heard is true and more than I have ever heard is true. What about us? What did Jesus say? She'll rise in the judgment and will condemn this religious generation. If she did it in his day, and if they were that way in that day, the world's group 2,000 years in sin since then, what will it be in this day? When Hebrews 11 said, says, seeing it, we are compassed about. With such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. Hebrews, the twelfth chapter, speaking of the eleventh, where the great witnesses was done, the supernatural was performed. And Paul saying, seeing that we are compassed with that type of witnesses, let's lay aside every sin. What is sin? Unbelief. Let us lay aside every sin, every weight. Everything that's contrary 
and run with patience the race that's set before us. In that last generation, and this may be it, and I believe that it is. And if Jesus said, in his generation, with all of his power and nothing less than Jehovah God made flesh, for in him dwelt the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, and yet him living before the Holy Spirit came, said, there is forgiveness for you to reject him, the gift of God sent to do the miracles that he did, discerning their thoughts. He said, that will be forgiven. But when the Holy Spirit is come, just one word against it will never be forgiven. And this world are in the world to come. Oh, America, America, how you say I'm rich and have the best churches in the world and the greatest missionaries and the best fed and the best dressed. How little you know that you're naked, miserable, blind, poor, and wretched and don't know it. Remember, your day is now. Tomorrow may be too late. It's the word of the Lord. Think of it while we pray. Oh, blessed Lord. It is written and you have said that the scriptures cannot be broken. That if the righteous be scarcely saved, where will the sinner and the ungodly appear? And knowing now with Sputniks in the skies and a heathen nation that God has raised up to bring judgment to us, that we could be doomed before morning. And that all the signs postponing at the end time and your blessed Spirit coming into our midst and doing the very thing that you said that would take place, and America groups in her sin of rock and roll and all these other things, unconcerned, eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, building, doing sin, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. We are not alarmed, Lord. You said it would be this way. We're just happy to know that we're living in this day. To see it. Judge us now, Lord, and give us mercy while the mercy is still flowing free. And forgive us of our unbelief and granted us pardoning grace. In the name of thy Son, with our heads bowed, and the music softly playing, I wonder tonight, and in this little audience that went through the snow, you say, Brother Branham, you're a very rude minister. It's better to tell you the truth, brother than to pat you on the shoulder knowing you're wrong. Would you say this? God, I want to be right. I want to be a real believer. Help thou my unbelief. Would you raise your hand to him? Every head thou just raise your hand. God bless you, my just dozens of hands in this little crowd. That's honest confession. You know what you've done when you raise your hand? You say, Brother Branham, what, what did that do to him? Well, it meant the difference between death and life. You know you defied the laws of gravitation when you did that? Gravitation holds your hand down. And there's no way for your hand to be lifted up. But there's a spirit in you that made a decision. 
that recognized that you were wrong and you need Christ. And you defied those laws of gravitation and raised your hand towards heaven where your Savior looks at you. He puts your name on his book. Do you really mean it? Now, Father God, grant pardoning to each one. Forgive their sins. O oh God, you hear my prayer. All their unbeliefs, may it be under the blood. And may they be dressed just now in the righteousness of Christ. And we would pray that you would come to us and manifest yourself to these new babies, that they might know that their faith is not in vain, that Jesus that walked the Sea of Galilee, who discerned the Spirit of the Jew who came by the name of Nathaniel, told him who he was and where he'd come from, who said to the old fisherman Peter, who he was and who his daddy was, who told the woman at the well her wrong, who perceived her thoughts and promised that the things that I do shall you also. And he said, I do nothing till my father shows me first than that I do. Seeing this last day, Lord, that he promised these things, the written scriptures which cannot be broken, Grant that peace will rest in their heart. And all the mountains that's before them, may they crumble this very night with that faith that they have just raised their hands to receive. If they are sick, may that mountain crumble. If they have had a mountain of unbelief, may it crumble. May every obstacle crumble that stands between them and good health and serving the living God. For we ask that in Jesus Christ's name, as I present them to thee, Father, they are the trophies of this message, and they are love gifts that God has given to his Son, and no man can pluck them out of his hand. They have eternal life and shall never come to the judgment. We thank thee, in Christ's name, amen. <clears throat> Do you feel real good? Don't you just love to enjoy the presence of the Holy Spirit? It just does something to you. Now, it is prayer time now. Now, each of you people that raise your hand, just accept him in what he promised. Now watch. If he has raised from the dead, he's here. He promised wherever two or more would gather in my name, I'll be in their midst. He said, the works that I do shall you also. A little while and the unbelievers will never see me again. They'll go on, Beelzebub and so forth. It's nothing to it. But ye shall see me, for I will be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. Here he is at the end of the Gentile age, doing the same thing that he did. Now, if he stood here tonight wearing my clothes that he gave me, if he was standing here and you were sick, could he heal you? Be careful. No, sir. He has already done it. Could he forgive you of your sins? No, sir. He has already done it. It's your faith in his finished work at Calvary. That's what does it. Now, faith cometh by hearing, hearing of the word. Now, as God spoke to us tonight through his word, and Solomon, being a gift of God, that manifested the supernatural, the little queen pressed through more than snowstorms to get to hear what the Lord had done in Israel. Being a heathen pagan, how much more can we accept it tonight as his children pressed through a snowstorm to come and see him? I'm just as anxiously waiting as you are. Just as anxiously. It's a great thrill to my heart. Each night when I see him come on the scene, the omnipotent, 
the omnipresent, the great majestic God of heaven, move down. And if this shall be my last sermon, my word has been truth because it's been God's word. I've been in contact direct or indirect with over 10 million people, I suppose. And around the world it's been put to the test. Which doctors and everything else, not one has ever rose against it to what God took down. It's true. For there's no weary. If God promised it, God has to keep his word. The scientific world knows it. They got a picture back there that was taken of it. At Germany and Switzerland and in America, two or three times, hanging in Washington, D.C. with a word on it like this, the only supernatural being that was ever scientifically photographed. The picture of it's back there. The copyrights in Washington, one hanging in the religious hall of religious art. Now, he shared. Everything manifests itself. Every spirit manifests. If I told you the spirit of John Dillinger was in me, that outlaw, I'd be dangerous to stand on the platform before you. Because I'd have guns and I'd be a robber if his spirit's in me. If I had the spirit of an artist, I could paint the picture for you like the artist. If I say the spirit of Christ is in me, then I must do the works of Christ. Jesus said, the Father has sent me, and if I do not the works of God, then believe me not. But if I do the works and you can't believe me, believe the works that you might be saved. How plain. Your objective right, your motive right, sincerely dumped out of self and yield yourself to the Holy Spirit and watch what he'll do for you. Now, I believe last night we can't get all up here at once. It just can't work like that. How many knows that visions would weaken you? Or you, if you don't understand these things, just come this week and listen. Let me ask you something. Daniel the prophet had one vision and was troubled at his head for many days. How many knows that? Sure. Any Bible reader knows it. One vision. And people who are spiritually inclined are considered neurotics. Always. Look at poets, prophets, and what more? Look at Stephen Foster, who gave America's best folk songs. What was he? A neurotic? Every time he hit inspiration, when he dropped down, he didn't know where he was at. He'd get on a drunk. Finally called a servant, took a razor, and committed suicide. Look at William Kepper, who wrote that famous song, There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. When sinners plunge beneath the flood, lose all their guilty stains. When I was over to pray for the late King George, standing there in the graveyard by the side of his grave, William Kepper, I wept because I know what the man, after he came out from that inspiration, you know the story, he tried to commit suicide by drowning in the river. The inspiration left him. Look at Jonah the prophet, laid in the belly of a whale for three days and nights and was delivered out and brought his message in such a way and when the Spirit left him, he sat on a hill and prayed for God to kill him. Look at Elijah, after seeing the vision how to call far out of heaven and rain out of heaven at the same day, when the Spirit left him, he wandered in the wilderness forty days and nights and God found him pulled back in a cave. Oh, what's the trouble? The people in America needs missionary more than any place I ever seen. That's right. Now I've traveled the world over. They are so taught in dry doctrine and church theology till they know nothing about the Spirit. That's right. They don't understand it. Oh, that God would open eyes. When Jesus walked with the disciples all day long, they didn't know who he was. And maybe he's walked with you and kept you out of many things. You haven't recognized it. But when he got him in the room that night, he'd done something the way he used to do it before his crucifixion. And they recognized it was him because no other man on earth did it like that. Is that true? They recognized it because he did it the same way he did before he was crucified. 
Now, I pray that he'll come tonight and do the same thing that he did before he was crucified, that you might know that he has risen from the dead. What did we call from him? Is it Eve or Luke? One to fifteen and Eve? You got a hundred out? We started with number one last night. Eve, one to fifteen, they told me. Let's take Eve 50 to 65 then tonight. E 50 to 65. Line up over here to the right. And, all right, it looks like a short 15 to me, oh. Don't be scared. If you've got sin in your life, you confess it before you come if you don't want it called out. How many has been in other meetings and seen that taking place? Oh, sure. Yes, sir. He's Christ. <clears throat> Your card's called to fifth from, where was it, fifth, is it, fifty? Fifty to sixty-five? All right, sixty to sixty-five. Those who's got those prayer cards, you come. All right. Now, while they're, look at this. I want to ask you all a question. And before God Almighty, I want you to answer the truth. Am I a stranger to you people in the prayer line? If I am, raise your hand. Every one of you that I'm a stranger to. There's no way in the world for me. I've never seen you or talked to you or anything. Is that right? If we're strangers, is that right? I know nothing of you. How many out there are strangers to me? Raise your hand. Know that I don't know nothing about you. All right, there's your hands to God and yours mine too. I know nothing about you. Almighty God knows that. Now, the only way that that could be done, the only thing and the only possible way that it could be done with our hands as Christians in the air we've never met before, no way I've ever talked with you or nothing else. I know nothing about you. You're just a person that come here and given a prayer card and you're here and you all don't even have a prayer card. Well, this, don't, this is a minor thing. Ask the people who's my associates. I am 48 years old. That gift has been working since I was born. Gifts are not just given to you. Gifts and callings are without repentance. It's the foreknowledge of God. God has placed in the church. Moses couldn't help to be Moses. He was born Moses. Jesus was born the Son of God. John the Baptist, 712 years before he was born, Isaiah the prophet saw him and said, He's a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Oh, the omnipotence of God. Jeremiah. God said to Jeremiah, Before you was even conceived in your mother's womb, I knew you and sanctified you and ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then who are we? You're nothing. Neither am I. But it's a grace of God. Why can't we believe it? Here's a woman standing here, a middle-aged woman, hair gray. I've never seen the woman in my life, and God knows that. She's here for some... I don't know. I can't tell you. She might be a critic. If she is, watch what happens. Watch what takes place. How many has been in the meetings and seen critics come to the platform? They're laying in the insane institution, paralyzed and everything else. We're not playing church. It's church. Them days of that old cut and dried theologies and so forth is passed away. Christ is here, giving his last message to the Gentiles as he promised. And it's going to bow the heads of the people, and they do not recognize it. That's the sad part. If this woman and I under the oath of God that we've never met in our life. And the Holy Spirit will reveal to that woman what she's standing there for. What ought that to prove? That Jesus Christ, who did the same thing to witness himself and make himself known to both Gentile, or to both Samaritan, and also to the Jew. And when he did it before the Jew, the real Jew recognized it to be the sign of the Messiah. 
How do I mean knows that? St. John 1. And when he'd done it to the Samaritan, what did the woman say? She's, when he told her, her what was wrong with her, she said, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. We know when the Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. He said, I'm he that speaks. She ran into the city and listen to her message. Come see a man that told me the things that I've done. Isn't this the Messiah? Now, he never went to the Gentiles. Listen, he never healed anybody in Samaria. How many knows that? He didn't. Why? He knew that Philip was coming down to preach that big revival. And he never went to the Gentiles. Because the Gentiles has more or less been a wild tree anyhow in the sight of God. So he's left that to the last day at the closing of this dispensation. And here he is. He forbid his disciples to go to the Gentiles while he was on earth. But now he's appearing to the Gentiles. Just don't be discouraged. Stick around just a little bit for the week and listen to the Word. See what the Word says. Then compare it. If it's not Bible, it's not truth. If it is the Bible, it is the truth. Now, if the, this woman and I, who never have seen each other in our lives, if the Holy Spirit will reveal what the woman's there for, you know it'll have to be supernatural then. If you believe it's a devil, you will receive a devil's reward. If you believe it's God, you'll receive God's reward. It's the way you approach a gift. The woman, the soldier, the woman that touched the hem of Jesus' garment, she received healing. The soldier that put a rag around his head and said, let's try out this gift and see if it's right. And he got a stick and hit Jesus on the head, said, if you're a prophet, tell us who hits you and we'll believe you. God don't clown for nobody. He never opened his mouth and said a word. He just let him alone. And he's in torment tonight, no doubt. And he'll never be delivered. The woman's in glory tonight, enjoying the blessings of God forever. Just depends on what attitude you take. You don't realize the day we're living. God be merciful to us now. The rest is yours. There's nothing that I could do, nothing no one else could do. But I pray, God, that you will do that which you've promised. And now we commit ourselves unto thee for this service that this people in the resurrection time might stand without any excuses for the newspapers are full of it, the radio has blasted it, and the entire country round about will be without an excuse. So let it be known, Lord, to these who press the snowstorm tonight that the truth has been read out of your Bible and you meet with the share and thou knowest, Lord, the lovely Savior, I know not these people, and it's nothing of myself, it's your grace that permits this. I pray for each one in myself, in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Now just be real reverent. Don't move for just a few minutes. Sit still. Don't get nervous. Just relax. Just, just relax and submit yourself to the Holy Spirit. Watch what he'll do. All right, lady, you may stand right there. This is a picture, like was in the Bible, a man and a woman. Again, as I said last night, it was a woman, the first one. I have no idea who's coming up here. The boys takes these cards and mixes them up and gives them out to you. Anybody that wants them can have them. And here you come. So, those out there don't have any cards. But what I have these for, so that I can single you out. See, Jesus, when he went to heal a man one time, he took him away from the crowd. When he went to raise Dryas' daughter, he put all the people out of the house. See, each person is a spirit. And if the spirit is unbelief, it hinders. He went to his own city. And many mighty miracles he could not do because of their unbelief. See? But where there was faith, God moved. Where there was no faith, God moved out. And now, if the Holy Spirit will reveal to me what you're standing there for, whatever it is, I know not, will you believe him with all your heart? Will the audience witness they'll do the same if the woman and I under oath to God that we've never met before? Now, do you want to take my place? See what it is? It's not nothing back in a dark room. It's right out here where you're standing looking. God don't dwell in darkness. God dwells in light. I'm, never fear, sister. 
He was the one who sent me. It's up to him to do it. I'll only tell the truth and preach the gospel, then it's up to him to judge and do the rest. Just the job that I have to do. Now, what am I doing? I'm doing the same thing the Lord did. He went up to the Samaria. The Father told him to go up there, but didn't tell him what to do. The Bible said that he had need go by there. He was on his road to Jericho down the mountain, but he went around Samaria. When he got there, he sat down, sent the disciples away to see what the Father would have him do. Because he said, I'd do nothing till he shows me. A woman come out. He talked with the woman a while, enough to get a conversation to catch her spirit. He found where her trouble was and told her her trouble. And as soon as he told her her trouble, she recognized that that was the Messiah. She said, we know the Messiah will do that, but you must be a prophet. He said, I'm the Messiah. And she said, that's the sign was the following. Now, would you believe the same? You will. May he grant it. It's my prayer. Now, if ever who's the engineer on this here, I never, it's in another world. I don't know where my voice gets loud enough to hear it or not. You just watch it, ever who's the doing it, to step it up or whatever it needs, you see. Now, the audience can hear me yet. The woman seems to be moving away from me. Between she and I stands a light, the light that you see on the picture. Now I see it breaking through, and it's in a, a room, something like a hospital room. And now she's suffering. She had an operation, and the operation was for a, a hideous black spirit called cancer. And the cancer, she had a breast removed. And from that breast removing, now... She has a swollen arm as a result of it. That's thus saith the Lord. That was the truth. You're the judge. How would I know anything about you? Something here that's telling me something about you, whatever it was. That's right, isn't it? Do you believe it's Christ wanting to help you? You do. How many believe the same? Then let us pray for the woman. Would you come here just a moment, sister? Merciful God of this poor dear woman standing here. I'm thinking of my own little mother tonight, maybe on her knees praying for me. And this may be somebody's mother. I pray that you'll help her, Lord, as I lay hands upon her. Thou hast said this. If they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. And I pray that this woman, whatever her trouble may be, that it may cease and God will receive glory. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now go believing the dark shadow left from around you. All right. Now do you love the Lord? Now don't you think we ought to say, thank you, Jesus? Thank you, Jesus. That's right. He wants to be worshipped. Now be real, real reverend. Lady... I, I suppose that we have never met before all of our life. Now here, listen. There's a spirit. Oh, if you just stay long enough in the meetings till you get this little superstition away from you. I know you think you're believing and you are partially, but just watch. Here, watch quickly. There's something wrong with this woman that's wrong with that woman sitting right there. The same thing. You have trouble with your legs that you want me to pray for. You have the same. That's right. All right. Not only that, but there's something wrong with your chest, too. If that's right, lady, just stand up to your feet. This young woman sitting here on the front. All right. Do you believe? You were sitting there wondering. And when this woman walked up here, a real strange feeling come to you. If that's right, that's right. See? What was it? It was that same spirit, demon, that's tormenting this woman, was tormenting that, and it's tormenting that man sitting right back there looking at me, too. Leg trouble. 
All right. If you'll believe with all your heart, see what he's doing? That's a kindred spirit. He knows that the Spirit of God is present and he's scared. That's exactly right. All right. God bless you, lady. The darkness that hung over you is gone. Your faith. You touched something, didn't you? I don't know. Have I ever seen you? Are we total strangers? You're just a woman who's sat there? Is that right, sir? A husband sitting there? Total strangers? Never seen each other? Probably never heard of one another. I know I never heard of you as far as I know. I don't know who you are. So there we are, perfect strangers. And your wife is healed sitting there. What was it? It's the Spirit of the living God. Can't you see it, church? Certainly. Now, I say to you, you believe like she did. Say to the Lord Jesus, Lord, I believe, and find out what happens. Now, let's see. Your trouble was the same as that trouble. Now, if I, you believe God, you believe that it's over, it's your faith that does it, nothing I can do. Here, I see somebody else appear. And that's a younger woman than you are. It's your daughter. And she's doing something about a pulpit. She's a preacher. And she's real nervous. And she's going through the menopause. And you were standing there praying for her then. That's right. That's right. Raise up your hand. You believe? Then have faith in God and you can be healed. The Lord bless you, sister. You go and receive and believe just what you have and it'll all be all right for you. Amen. I don't believe we ever met. Totally stranger. No way at all for me to know you. All right. I don't move. Just sit still just a minute. They won't let me stay too long. Be in no hurry. Yes, Mother. Sitting right there on the end of that little sh thing around your head, right the second row back there. You've got a chest trouble and a throat trouble. Yes, sir. You were sitting there praying to be healed. Stand up on your feet just a minute. Receive your healing now. You touched him. Believe it with all your heart. It'll be over. Amen. Do I know you? No, oh, man. If I don't know you, raise up your hand. So, never seen you in my life. All right? Just believe. That's all he asked to believe. If I don't know you, the Lord will reveal to me what you're standing here for. Will you believe him? If the audience don't believe now, they never will. They've already made up their mind whether they're going to or not. But you're here for a condition in the stomach. You got a bad stomach trouble, and that's, I see you waking up through the night, rubbing yourself like that. That's it. That got out of bed many times to hold yourself like this. Just recently did it and walked on the floor. Lady, that is true. No one in the world know that but you and God, because there's nobody else awake. Not only that, but I see you also suffering with a headache. You got a trouble in your head that caused you to have severe headaches. And then another thing that you might know that I be God's servant, just share under the, his permission. You've got a knot under your arm that you want me to pray for. If that's right, wave your hand back and forth like this. Do you believe it's over? Then it is. Amen. Go and receive as you have believed. God be merciful. If you can believe. A lady with a blue coat on sitting right there. Light over you. You from Wisconsin sitting there, Madison, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. I never seen you in my life. If that's right, raise up your hand. If we're perfectly strangers. But there's that light. Can't you see that people? Right over that woman?
something wrong with your foot. You won't pray for it in sinus trouble. That's right. Well, you've touched something. You're 40 feet or more from me. We never met before, but the Holy Spirit's here. All right, believe now and go home. It'll all be over. We're strangers, too. Is that right? Just so you hold your hand to people and see. No way for me to know anything about you. We're strangers. The Holy Spirit here who knows us both, though. Is that right? If God will reveal to me something in your life that will tell you what has been, you'll know whether that's true or not. Your trouble, what you want me to pray for, is your back. That's right. A back trouble. Now you pray and ask Jesus for something else. And see if he can hear prayer and answer prayer. All right? Yes, there's somebody else you're praying for. That's a child. That's right. And the child has had polio. Got something wrong with his arm. Correct. I see they're taking it to church, though. It's a church. It's a, the parents belong to a church. That's right. You want me to tell you what church they belong to? They're Methodists. That's right. <laughs> now go believe with all your heart and you'll receive just what you've asked for. God grant him. Are we dead in sin and trespasses? Has our unbelief so closed us up? Young man, are we strangers to each other? I've never seen you in my life. We're... But when a man came to meet the Lord Jesus one time, he told him what his trouble was and where he was and so something other about him. And when, as soon as that was done, what did this Nathaniel say? Thou, thou art the Christ. Thou art the King of Israel. Now, if I don't know you, and I have no ability of my own, I, I'm just a man like you are, then there's got to be something because do you believe God promised this? You believe it? You're not here for yourself. You're standing here for somebody else. And that person is a person that's played with you younger. It's your brother. That's right. And that person isn't here. That person's from another country. That's right. Got stomach trouble, high blood pressure. And that person's in a place where it's, it's not like this country here. It's a place where there's a lot of pines, great big high pines and mountains, and it's in a city that sits on a hill. And the hill is near a lakeside. I've been in that city. It's Washington. Bellingham, Washington, near the Puget Sound. Thus saith the Lord. You believe? Then go and receive as you have believed. So will it be to you. Have faith. Don't doubt. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. Pray. You pray and the heart trouble will leave you. You believe it will? They go accept it. Go be made well. In Christ's name, may God grant it to you is my prayer. Now, when I said heart trouble to her, a strange feeling come to you. When I said heart trouble, because the same thing was on her, was on you, and it's both gone. You believe me to be a servant? All right, then it's gone. Amen. You go believe. You have just exactly what you asked for, if, if you'll believe. There's times in your life, recently, when we make a step that hurts you, that arthritis is bad. Do you believe that God will make you well? You do? Then go on your road and rejoice and thank God for it. It'll leave you and won't come again. Are you believing? Now you out in the audience, you start believing. Start having faith. Believing God. Somebody.
I have no way of knowing it. I can only say what he tells me. I, 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 I don't operate this. It operates me. I just yield myself. It's your faith that does it. Here. Here's a woman sitting right here by this man sitting right here on the front seat. Head down praying. Do you believe, sister? You're a Christian, a believer. If you, if God will reveal to me what you're praying about, am I a stranger to you? Here, that, where the lights are hanging, the little lady sitting there. You believe with all your heart? It's your throat, and also your nose. That's right, isn't it? All right, you're healed. You can go home. How many wants to be healed now? Raise your hands. Just say, I want to be healed. Are you convinced? Do you believe that Jesus Christ, God's Son, is here? Do you believe it's Him doing it? If you do, raise your hand to Him like this. Yes. How I've often wondered the biggest mystery that I've ever seen. In Durban, South Africa, when something like that taken place, 30,000 raw heathens came to Christ at one time. I made one prayer, and Brother Bosworth, whose body is laying in state tonight, stood there, an honest man, where they took 25,000 records of healings in one prayer. The next day they had seven truckloads of crutches, stretchers, clubs, and things that the people walked on that they picked up on the fairground, where 150,000 people were sitting. Seven truckloads. A big cattle trucks, just because they seen the presence of God and they believed it with all their heart and got right up and went away healed. But we're so full of superstitions. Dr. Jones said it's hypnotism. Dr. Sobody says, well, it can't be trusted. And you've been so indoctrinated by all kinds of theologies until it's hard for the Holy Spirit to move in. Let's throw that thing away tonight. Let's believe God and stand up on your feet. Just a minute. I want to ask you a sincere question. What more could the Holy Spirit do? Christ come and died. Christ paid the price. Christ returned back into his branches to prove his work of his resurrection. He's here with his promise through the Bible, with his spirit saying that he's here. He only thing is left is for you to believe it and accept it and act on it. Is that right? Then let us pray. Lord God, creator of heavens and earth, author of everlasting life, and giver of every good and perfect gift, send thy spirit of power upon this audience and seek down through here till you find an honest heart, full of faith. Then heal that person, eternal God. May the Spirit come into their body and quicken them to a new faith that they've never known before, knowing that Jesus Christ, God's Son, is here in the Spirit that will judge them at the judgment seat of Christ will, is standing here now in our presence. May all the sickness and diseases and afflictions and doubt be escaped and go from this building in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You that believe and accept your healing, raise your hands to God and say, I believe. Lord, I believe. God bless you. All that loves him, say a great big amen. amen. All right. Dr. Lee Bale.